One, two brief words of introduction, very brief. Um, Eberhard and I have known each other uh, several years and realized that we have conflicting views. So since we got on well together, we thought uh, uh, we, we could stand up here and have a courteous discussion. So, uh, and we met for lunch to discuss the occasion, and the only thing we decided was I was going first. <laughs> <laughs> so I have no idea what Eberhard's going to say. He probably has a slightly better idea than I'm going to say, because he's said it before. But otherwise, we haven't seen each other's presentation. And we thought that would be much more fun for both of us, as well as for you. Um, the other thing, of course, is, is the title. I think this took us more time to define the title um, than it did to uh, sort out who's going to sort of love. Haven's Wall, as I'm sure you all know and appreciate, is a very substantial construction. As originally planned, it was going to be 10 Roman feet wide, which is 9.6, 2.87 um, meters or something like that wide. And, and you see here, and here, striding across the landscape as a very uh, still surviving substantial structure, and it immediately covers up in all our minds a function. Sorry, um, I'm, I'm jumping a slide ahead of me. I simply want to point out that it runs run right away the way across from the River Tyne to the Solway, that um, eventually, as finally constructed, that stone wall and divides, as it were, Britain into two islands. It's so substantial. That is, in part, how the uh, people of the time saw it. And when you come to look at anybody's reconstruction, I'm starting off with uh, Alan Sowell's 1950s, I suspect, I can't remember, and you immediately have put in your minds a view of Hayden's Wall, which I suspect none of you can escape. <laughs> uh, and this is part of the difficulty. Uh, very evocative, striding across the countryside, here, marching on and on. But when you come and look at it in detail, there's a cornice, a uh, string course here, uh, very close uh, crenellations with murder caps on them and a wall. Uh, Peter Comey had died uh, just a few months ago. It, his reconstruction is a little different. Um, his crenellations are still quite close together. He's still got this string course. Uh, his uh, uh, Merlons are a little simpler. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, in, in this uh, panoply of reconstructions in 3D, here's the one at Vindolanda, which you can immediately see is based upon uh, songs. Because we've got these very close um, crenellations uh, and along here, uh, with a wall wall behind it. Cannot see it last. And the string cords. Now, the only thing genuine here are the stones and the string cords. The string cords is a flat Roman stone which have been found in various places, fallen in front of the wall. So we know they were there, but we don't know what their focus was. When we come to look at that reconstruction, uh, those reconstructions, I should say, uh, we are coming back so often to this, the Casper Praetoria in Rome, where we have this uh, upper part here, dates to the late 3rd and 4th centuries, but up to this level, it's uh, roughly repaired, admittedly, but it's roughly speaking the uh, Tiberius' port of the early 1st century, with the string ports, as you can see, and we might be able to see here the crenellations which are in fact five feet apart and not the two to three feet you can see. So what I want to show you this for is simply because practically all our reconstructions come back to a fort wall or a town wall and we extrapolate from that to something which is entirely different, which is a protein wall. Here's a some British evidence, if you don't know, well worth looking at. Difficult to get in, but I'm sure somebody will take you beyond the iron gates in, in law. Because here, John Martin, six foot uh, two, or was. So you can get an idea of the sheer height of the fourth wall in York. I 
back on the top of it, and you can see what is presumably the marking outline for parapet. But this is entirely different from Hayden's Wall. Behind that was an earthen bank, so you could move around with great facility on the top of that and on, on the stones. So, if I were to do this again, I'd punch out every other declamation um, for a start and just put one in the middle there. And uh, whether that's a correct interpretation, of course, is, is an entirely different matter, but I'm not altogether into interpretations, uh, reconstruction drawings today. A view of Haber's Wall and its function has been challenged recently, uh, in the last two decades, by the discovery of the berm, the space between the wall and the ditch on Haber's Wall and on the Antonine Wall, found almost exactly the same time of pits. So here we've got the foundation of the Haber's Wall. Uh, at there, the black is the ditch, and between the wall and the ditch are these pits. Three rows arranged differently, and in the appropriate reconstruction drawing, um, provide us with a, a picture, uh, something like this. Uh, in each pit, there were the stainings of two 40 centimeter timbers. 40 centimeters is big. I put a swear word in there just to emphasize it, if you weren't so polite people. But 40 centimeters is very substantial. And what we believe we are looking at are stakes, um, tree trunks cut off, branches trimmed to form these sort of stakes. But the question is, does the discovery of these make it more or less likely that there was a war war? I mean, if there wasn't a war war, you could argue that these were put in to re replace it, as it were, to make it more difficult because there are people uh, uh, parading on the top. So the discoveries of, the discovery of, of these argue that it makes it more likely that there was a war war to add additional uh, protection. But we can go and look elsewhere to try to help us appreciate this problem. This is a burning wall. It's a Roman frontage. Uh, there's a wall, there's a fence, which is uh, a, uh, a wall, two of them off. We've got single uh, watchtowers like this, which we have in the Hades wall, and at the bottom, we've got these things which are rather like these stakes, which are like big caltrops along the bottom. And this is not anything to do with preventing an army. You can imagine a tank, that uh, wouldn't it didn't happen, rolling over that in a few minutes' time and squashing it flat. This was entirely to do with controlling the movement of people. This is what the normal reconstruction of the German front here is like, with that fence, because we know it was a fence here, how to say, with these observation towers. How similar it is. The only thing we haven't got in Germany are the states on the bottom. At least, I should say, yet. <laughs> and the Israeli wall is very similar. This is just a metal equivalent of a palisade defense. It's very substantial, but very thin. As indeed is um, the major Roman frontier in Germany. This is um, something like uh, uh, two to three feet thick. So it's emphasizing that Hayden's Wall is different. It's much bigger, more substantial frontier work than what we're looking at here. So was Hayden's Wall built to stop invasions? Actually, if we're told what Roman frontiers were built for, or at least one was built for, and I behaving awfully badly in extrapolating from a handful of inscriptions in one bit of modern Hungary to the home of the Roman Empire. But this records under the reign of Polybus, who made the land in 92, on the river, Ripan, uh, the construction of Burgi's towers um, from the ground and, and at the same time forts uh, to stop the um, uh, clandestine 
secret actions of the totally high bandits. So what these towers and these forts are built for is not to stop the Germans coming over the hill or the Alamanni or, the, uh, or even later the battles. Their towers and forts are built to stop the secret activities of bandits, illicit people doing things illegally in Roman arms. Might be raiding, but it's people who are doing secret things which they ought not to be doing. All, all those things were called common prayer there. <laughs> so we told them what these forts and towers are built for. And on the head of this wall, we have not just the wall, but we have forts and stones. Um, and we have gates. This is very famously constructed in the general plan here with, with a very simple gate built. It's very similar to the simple gates on the Burning Wall. Here we are. And we have a, it looks no way on the wheelchair with the pedestrians here, uh, but it's a very simple um, entry point uh, with guards on, such as we've just seen, and the barrack, um, as occurs in some places of the German and certainly on the British frontiers. Now, just to go back to this, this is important because what we have a whole series of people coming into the empire. So, so far we've got defence in our minds, we've got um, controlling illegal uh, crossings of the frontier, and we've got now, I think, something different. Because what we know absolutely clearly uh, from various uh, pieces of evidence, is one of them, that the Romans controlled not only access into the empire, but access around the frontier zone. So, both Tacitus, at the very beginning of the second century, Cassius Dio later in the third the second century, uh, absolutely specific that you could only come into the empire through one of those gates if you were at, at, at specific, specified places and received unarmed to agreed marketplaces under military escort. And this from the Eastern Desert of Egypt is such a, a document, it's a pass. It's obvious Sabinus, who is the statuarius at Fort Knox, uh, giving a permit uh, to a man and his three donkeys, or whatever he says, uh, to go to Novius Dratus at the next statue and hope that he will be able to move on from there. It's absolutely remarkable. You come into the Roman Empire, you can come in at a gate, and then you are given a pass to proceed to the next point. It, and sometimes a soldier would actually be reputed to go with you. So when we come to look at this, we're now seeing a third function. Now, I will not in any way say, and if this has ever slipped through my lips before, I utterly wrong before you, I would never say that Roman frontiers are built for this bureaucratic purpose. It's just that once they are there, other things accrue to the frontiers. And it's simply easier to say, okay, well, if you want to come into, as we would say, gorgeous Europe today, you have to come in where we specify, um, and then the full rigors of the bureaucracy uh, will, will descend upon you. Um, but the soldiers simply acquire these duties because they're there to stop initially. Uh, invasions, and then also the illicit actions of these uh, bandits. What I want to do too is to emphasize that we are looking at two primary functions. One is military defense, and the other is frontier control. So we see this absolutely explicitly when Hadrian's Hager, when Wall is constructed. We've got the forts which are already there we, uh, on a line across the country, 500 or more, men in the Indian, quite a lot. Um, and Hayes Ward is added to the front of those. It's a barrier to absolutely control access and movement across the frontier, which these would necessarily do because they're at least seven miles apart with gates through them. And then while Hayes Ward is being constructed, the forts are uh, the units that move from here up, up to the wall line itself, as I've shown, and the valor of the great earthwork is putting behind the wall. And 
the effect of this is to reduce the number of crossing points from 80 on every mile to one, one at every four, one at every up to 16. Which I would argue is quite straightforward to do with in tightening on movement across the frontier, the frontier control. So if we've got the wall, an original gate at four fields, the wall running along the tracks, and behind it was great earth like the ballad with Richmond and um, characterizes the road equipment far wire to say say very clearly you've come across here, you're into the military zone, you should not be there. You could jolly well know you should be there because you can't get over this easily. Um, and, and this great sort of um <coughs> annex along the wall the monetary zone is is erected. <coughs> When we come back to look at the very size of Hayden's Wall, which has perplexed people for um, well over 100 years. 150 years ago, Monson argued that the reason why Hayden's Wall was so massive was because the enemy was fiercer in Britain than he was in Germany. And he grappled with the problem. I don't agree with him, but he grappled with the problem. Whereas the other front is, as you can see, frontier wall on much tighter. So why is Haven's wall so thick? I think it comes down to Haven himself. Um, he, um, we would, anybody would be sticking their neck out to say he wanted to make a statement, but we know from the surviving sources he um, had an interest in architecture. Um, we, uh, we know he liked the grand gesture, and anybody who's been to his villa Tivoli just outside Rome will understand his concept of grand gesture. So why not paint his wall as another grand gesture? And why was it built like it was? Well, what Haven knew when it came to war was the walls around the Greek cities. This is a Greek city, it doesn't have to be in Greece, it's trapped on in, um, in Turkey, and I'm sure most of this is later in date, but it makes the point this sort of Greek city wall is what they knew. So we're going to build a new wall, and I want to make a statement, this is what would be, I would argue to you, in his mind. And he put on it to, to, uh, to look after it, the soldiers with their uh, various uh, um, actions. And the final point I want to make, uh, I believe, comes kind of back to emphasize my duality of function, the defense of the province in the hands of the soldiers in units, which are in the initial plan of Hayden's Wall, not actually on the war, the soldiers on the war to concern with frontier control, because this is also how the German frontier worked. The war class pointed out that in various places on the German frontier, there are two ports. This is a small one where the men would appear to have the duty of looking after the frontier by itself, whereas this one, which was occupied by cavalry, um, had a different duty of supporting frontier if you came under an attack, or moving beyond the frontier, leaving the other soldiers to maintain watch and ward on the frontier line. And we can see the space in even roughly seven miles apart. So here, um, roughly 20 miles apart, uh, well, uh, one, two, three uh, places along the front, and you get this twinning of force, suggesting, as I mentioned before, separate functions. So, from, uh, and uh, this is what happened with Hayden's War, uh, where the force actually placed um, a stride the wall, which gave <laughs> enormous mobility to soldiers coming out of the side gates, the back gates here and the door front gates there, so we, we can see their interest in mobility in the landscape. So I would simply argue that what we, when we're looking at Hayden's Wall, we have to separate it out two functions. Defence, which is in the hands of the, the, the soldiers in these uh, army units in ports, uh, initially separated from the wall, always separated from the frontier in general, and the duties of the soldiers on the wall itself, uh, which is frontier control of, as we see here, bureaucracy. President, fellow members, guests, let me start off by saying that I'm a great admirer of David Pleas. 
it would be very entertaining if it offered 20 minutes of praise <laughs> instead focused exclusively on hypotheses which I disagree with. <laughs> I should also point out that David is, of course, the world authority on Hadrian's Mondiantian and all knows vastly more about them than I do. I will not focus exclusively or mainly on Hadrian's Mondiantian and all, but on French wars across the ancient world in general. Now, We've already heard Monks, and I'm citing here from your recent book. Theodore Monson suggested that the two British frontiers appeared more defensive than the German counterparts. My reason for that distinctiveness, however, is simply that Hadrian had a strong hand in the design of his French in Britain. Now, of course, one sees here Hadrian's wall more massive than the reconstructed wall in Racia, which you see here, and following the contours of the landscape is rather different indeed. So what should they think of Monson? And my view would be plain and simple, Monson was right. If we, if we look at uh, Hadrian's wall and the Antonine wall at the top, they use the terrain, they overlook enemy territory. So if you attack the Antonine Wall or Hadrian's Wall, you are facing, in the literal sense, an uphill struggle. The very same is true if you look at the late antique Sasanian Walls, the Gorgon Wall in northern Iran, very steep climb if you want to attack the wall at this point, or the Gilgilcha Wall in modern Azerbaijan, where again you are at a distinct disadvantage. This is no coincidence that these walls are built where they are built. Look by contrast at the German Limes, which has, as we well know, a section which over 80 kilometers is absolutely dead straight, pays absolutely no attention to the terrain at all, even so it is very military. They are very different functions. The same, of course, which to some extent is said by the much more recent war, which we've already heard about, that is of course the early moon. Hadrian's wall indeed does not look like that. <clears throat> look, for example, at the Peel Gap Tower. Now, if you want the tower for observation purposes, can you find a worse place? <laughs> this here is, it is in the valley. Um, you have a much better view from the point of view where I've taken the photograph. You have to build an enormously high tower in order to have a similar view. By contrast, as our colleague Jim Crow points out here, we found the possible slingshots, we found the list of all time. It does make sense to block the possible passage of anybody wishing to attack the wall at a deep point where there is natural, where there is level ground, unlike nearby on the tracks. Now, David, you had a number. <laughs> you, you are believing that there's quite possibly not even the war book, as we've already heard, and I'm just citing from your fourth edition of the handbook. No indubitable evidence has been found that there was a wall along the top of the wall. It would have been superfluous and inappropriate for an offensive force such as the Roman army. So do forget about the knowledge reconstruction drawing on the right, those of them incidentally taken from the top of yours. Um, and, and instead, instead look at the left side. That's what Hayden's wall really looked like, or did it? Now, let us have a closer look at, at your arguments. No other French is known to have had a wall. These were provided in four walls, but Hayden's wall was a very different structure. Counter arguments, my first. Now, this is a map of most Roman branches, which we know. It's from Joel Napoli's work on Recherche sur les modifications des liens Roman. There are very few comparable Roman monuments. Many of them are short and indeed serve the different functions, such as the Clausura in Northern Africa. Many of them are earthworks. And virtually all of them are heavily damaged and not uh, surviving to full height. So I think the fact that we have no other one with the surviving wall does not prove that Hagen's wall didn't have. 
Furthermore, let us have a look at the Chiasanese longbow at the Canicula Canicoli Peninsula. It's um, no, admittedly, it's not in a front shop. Admittedly, it's about 400 years younger than Hadrian's Wall in its present form. But I was quite similar, moving from coast to coast. It's not a fort or a town. And according to Procopius, his book on buildings, you have the passage here, this had a very elaborate wall wall. And then you fill the wall, you believe more of in the first plan, there were to be very few men on the wall, far too few, to operate in any military capacity from such a position. <coughs> Is that what? Now, let us have a look as to what um, Germanic tribesmen were capable of doing a century before the Ancient was built. According to Tacitus Annals, the Germanic tribe of the Angulivari had built an earthwork, the Latin term is Agor, which formed the boundary against the neighboring tribe of the Kerusk. In AD 16, the advancing Roman army decided to storm this particular long wall. And this wall was, and Tacitus is very specific about this, was manned by the Germans and defended against the Roman army. When the Roman army tries to storm it, soldiers suffer heavily from blows from above. Germanicus, the commander of the Roman forces recognizes that this is an unequal fight. That's specifically how it's written in the Latin version. It is an unequal equal fight. And has to resort to slingers and artillery to drive the Germanic defenders off the earth. Now this does raise a question, does it not? And the question is this. If Germanic tribes were capable of defending a mere earthwork against the Roman army, why should the Roman army have been incapable of defending the war against the Britons? And indeed, while we know very little as to what the German uh, tribal boundary of the Angulimari had looked like, it has not yet been identified with certainty. It was probably comparatively dating. Of course, we know that Hadrian's war was a far more elaborate structure. Now, I agree with David that these obstacles which have been found in advance of Hadrian's Wall and the Antonine Wall would have made perfect sense even if there was no war. It still would have stood to the enemies. No questions about that. But <clears throat> while you are assuming you are attacking, in Hadrian's Wall, while you're trying to make your way across, while potentially even trying to cross um, covered pits in which the appointed states, as Caesar describes them, in which case you would have severely injured your feet, um, if there were defenders of the wall who discharged slingshots or indeed arrows against you, you would have been in a distinct desert. Now, most armies do what does most damage to their enemies and reduces casualties in their own right. Think of the First Gulf War. In the First Gulf War, the American army, first of all, um, spent about a month bombarding the Iraqi position with explosives, and the poor soldiers were then eventually buried alive with large digging machines. Um, now, the question arises, the American army had been capable of breaking through the Iraqi defenses without dropping a single bomb. And the question, the answer is unquestionably yes. But the reason they did this is to minimize casualties, successfully minimize casualties amongst the own right. That's the same what the Roman army does here. It does make absolute military sense to have these wars manned and to defend them. So we are seeing those not as the German dreamers, as you like to point out, uh, further evidence that Monson was right, um, but we do see them at sites which are in major danger, such as the famous 
which were uh, or the um, the siege works, the circumvallation, the control of the balance or at Alicia or Caesar. And very similar to that, we have to mention that while you're trying to make your way across all of those obstacles, you are being bombarded with missiles. You also find them with other sites, where there's a particular range and such as, for example, at uh, the invasion period of fortress of fortress. And very similar also to Persian there. Here the Golden Wall. If you wanted to storm the Golden Wall, the Golden Wall, that is where the, uh, this was well, only Paris part, that's the man who was moved. In front of it, there's a water filled canal, which is more than two meters deep. So while the defenders are standing 10 to 50 meters above, above the canal bottom, depending on the height of the wall, you would have had to swim across the canal. You would have been at an enormous disadvantage. Now, again, there's no 100% evidence that there was a war war, but I would say 99 out of 100, at least, there was a war war on top of the Golden War because it just it does make absolute defensive sense for them to be there. How high was the Golden War? We don't really know. Because like Hadrian's Wall, it has been blocked out, but we know that it's about 200 kilometers long. There are about 500 kilometers from every 50 meters or so along it. And so this would have been probably built to a substantial height. Looking at other defensive barriers, build of materials, not worth building. This year's still built, Shalmatrek Wall at the uh, Caspian coast in modern Azerbaijan. It survives to height of six or seven meters. Look at this horse, just as a scale. Um, this is a massive barrier. You don't build this, uh, you build this just to many castles. This would have been built over 10 meters high. This is a massive barrier against armed invasion. The Durban Wall, also the same in the south of Russia, is leading into the Caspian Sea two meters under, under these contemporary water level so that you cannot easily bypass them. These are massive defenses which are designed not to be easily bypassed. And of course, they use nature very effectively for that purpose. Hadrian's wall leading on the tracks. The Pishkama rocks are used by, um, by the Gorgon wall. And of course, also the terminal of the Gorgon wall is high up. Uh, well, uh, higher power seem to be on your sides today, David. Well, this one works. So the uh, <coughs> the Golden Wall is terminating in a cliff high up in the Alps Mountains that you can easily bypass. And of course, also it is moved down to up from sea coast to sea coast. Now. A further argument we make is that the construction of many French works on behavior may reflect the shortage of manpower. Does it? Now, according to your own figures, there are about 9,500 men available today. Britain as a whole is strongly garrisoned, perhaps disproportionately strongly garrisoned, for, for a Roman French province. And again, let us also look at the Gorgon Wall, the Gorgon Wall, the combined size. Wall is about three times the Hadrian's Wall. They are densely occupied. Look at the barracks here. They are all densely filled with barracks. So we probably have three times the garrison, maybe something like 30,000 men. And I don't think it is believable that the world's largest French armies do reflect a shortage of manpower. They don't at all. And that is not even taking into account that in the hinterland of the Golden Wall we have even large fortifications, that's only about 20 hectares, it's more than 100 acres. Um, then we go to the ten rows in the lines of about 10,000 soldiers in each of them, there are at least four certain ones here for it, in the Golden Plain behind our behind the Golden Wall, not counting the very large one within a square kilometer, which may be the same here. Uh, these are temporarily garrisoned, but nonetheless, you have a massive troop concentration. It's one of the largest French armies in any French of any empire, and French wars might quite certainly do not attest a shortage manpower. Nor was the construction of this myriad of French installations necessary to protect the empire's soldiers. The soldiers of Rome were amply capable of defending themselves and preferred to fight in 
here. And again, let me draw a comparison with Rome's eastern neighbor, the Sasanian Empire. We are looking here at the Sasanian Empire, its greatest extent in the early 7th century, a massive empire, but an empire which faced, faced the joint opposition of the Roman Empire in the west, and first of all, the White Huns and then the Turks in the north. And we know very little as to what is happening in the east. Nonetheless, the Sasanian Empire is able to expand further right to the southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula in the 6th century, taking over much of the Levant in the early 7th century. Sasanian armies advanced as far as Constantinople, the richest and most popular city of Europe. Now, such expansion to the west is made possible through the, the Sasanian Empire successful defense of the global frontier zones for wars thereby guarding the prosperity of the interior, thereby having the surplus military forces to bring into play against the uh, Roman Empire. What happens if you don't have such bunch of wars? Look at the 19th century, when the uh, Gorgon Plain, just behind the Golden Wall, this area has no bunch of wars. At this time, troubles and has to be insecure, Situation: People are fleeing to the mountains. There's forest. Um, there's a thin population density, but not just. There's a wading which results from the area not being protected at the French region, but it also defends the core territories of Persia. So the Scottish struggle, James Fraser writes in the 1820s, bands of these fierce robbers, amounting to hundreds, would burst through the passes, leading from the deserts to the east of the capital city. So that's here and carry terror and desolation even to the gates of Kashan, as well known as Tehran. And of course, the very same phenomenon we see in the Roman Empire, when the circles, again, in the 5th century, Germanic invaders push deep into the interior of the empire. If you keep the defenses of the frontier strong, you will help both the French and core territories. Now, my final point is to just underline the defenses the defensive qualities of French word have a look at the Charing Cross, which uh, just had a chance to see one month ago. The Charing Cross word proved decisive in a war in the ancient firewalls, disproving any idea that these, uh, these barriers are not really very effective. Now, the story is this. In 1784, the Shah of Persia sent an army against, um, <laughs> against this area, which was not under his control at the time, notably the area of Asherabad, so the army crossed the Alpes Mountains, they advanced along the coastal plain, then crossed the Jarikuba Earthwork, which is not the end of it, unmanned the line, and reached Asherabad and laid siege to Asherabad. Now, uh, the defenders of Astrabat smartly noticed that um, the invasion army had not defended the Charikoba earthwork. So they sent um, a force to mend the Charikoba earthwork, therefore cutting off supplies and to the siege army. So they soon began to suffer from famine. They were soon defeated by the defenders of Astrabat. They were forced to flee. And the, those who fled were again caught, killed, or captured at the Jarl Kurban earthquake. And I think it is said, if I remember this was correctly, up to 10,000 were killed. So, in the age of firearms, um, earthquakes are far from just, uh, just a tech project of, of particular, particular rulers. They are very, very effective. They can make the difference between the success and survival of empires and the annihilation, and they can decide the outcome, of course. Now, I can't resist, in, as my very last slide, um, is the, having hoped the, my most, the very latest version of current archaeology to have a reader's letters in there and stated, I should say, this is not written in response to you, so and it don't you offend me, please. Um, and so this reader's letter by Bob Britta, who I might not know, um, and I couldn't have put it that to myself. Everybody has a theory which they bend the facts to fit. <laughs> Underpinning this is the current fashion for regarding history as a relatively benign process. The 
is probably a result of um, uh, the pacifist movement, which you know, of course have dominated history in the recent past. The simplest answer is probably the way. Apply this to Hadrian's rule, and it is obviously primarily that they will start. Yes, that's what it is, and that's what's also true for many of the other uh, linear variants. And I'd like to thank many people, most notably, of course, David, David Reese for uh, a, lot, a lot of inspiration. His books are enormously useful. I use them all the time when I actually visit Hayden's room, and there are so many things that it's a weird list, <laughs> which I agree with, sorry, which I haven't got time in 20 minutes to, to, to say. And of course, also to the Royal Archaeological Institute for having supported my, my work in all the and for numerous other sponsors and individuals, a small number of which are the big team who helped me with this, uh, this, this approach. And thank you to you to the audience for your attention. Um, thank you both very much indeed. Um, you will see that I have to resist the temptation to say that in the left corner and in the right <laughs> corner, um, because of course we are recording uh, this evening's proceedings. Um, this may be a little bit difficult uh, in the questions and points. I'm going to try and make sure this is working. Uh, I'm going to walk up and down with this, and I'm going to hand it to you um, so that people um, can be audible in making their points and asking questions. Um, but so far as the screen is concerned, um, I wouldn't be trying to advise speakers uh, to actually speak in front of the machine. Uh, but we will occasionally do a panel manage a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> so don't feel that you don't feel that you are excluded from the university. <laughs> so who would like to start? <laughs> you switched off. Martha, so, and then six on. And when it is great to be here, two of my calls. Maybe to speak to this lovely book of the internet present, you're alone. Of which there is no, there are two people who are very critical. Often said, it's true. There are all lot of books on the book, but there are only one book of the internet that I'm going to go back to. Um, and as an Emma, um, quite apart from the marvelous work of the Kiri Garden and the Kiri Garden, he is the actual author of the Chosen City of Pancras, the night from the very early year of the Roman invention of Britain, who is incredibly detailed. Ah, the Lord Tishin Tool. I would like to take up one point in particular, and this is this question of whether Hadrian Paul had a wall. Not. Um, I strongly believe that it did have a good job, and I believe that that is why it was required so that you can have a good If you have something more than a good job, you certainly need a character to the sun, possibly one at the rear. Um, why I think it had a good job, and it might be a big push to switch more. Why I think it's had a war war is partly if there is the wig, which of course they may put the right, it could be just a prestige thing. But also, um, I think that there uh, is a very sound reason why we could have a war war. Now, if you have a misty day, the turret give us a look out for the moon and uh, one every third of a mile of the bridges. Um, if you come to also the north part of the gate town of the mile cross, so it's a third of a mile, third of a mile, third of a mile. But if you have a misty day or it's a, a nasty night or something like that, it might be possible to sneak up. And if you have a patrol going over the top of the wall, that's great. A patrol along the rear of would be a huge disadvantage. They couldn't see a bloody thing. Because the wall would be there. So really you need to be on top of the wall to look over. Now um, developing that thing a, a bit, the frontier, um Adrian's frontier in southern Germany had consisted of a great 
timber fence, um, a palisade. At some stage, a ditch was dug on the road behind that with a great earthen mound. So instead of having a palisade um, and then a ditch, uh, or perhaps a palisade um, being back, flat back by an earthen mound, you have this rather curious um, sequence of from the road from the enemy side, a ditch is looking, you have from the enemy side, then a palisade, then you have a ditch, then you have the earth mound. Now, I think that earth mound, it has a piece of palisade still in existence, which perhaps um, maybe it doesn't ever ask me to tell you that. And I think in the past, in the few years, it was still. And I think that people, that the function of the, of the mound is that people could ride along the top of it and could have a view over the top and the floor. So it, they were really being very clever if that is correct. Because you can't, if you have just a single um, tree trunk thickness palisade, you can't, especially if you've got points on the top, a shaft and that kind of thing, you can't walk along the top of it. But you can rally behind it on this very plan. Um, the final point I'd like to make about this is that um, I personally believe that the Grunge Cup and Amiens Padre, which um, David has again recently written uh, about, that today, you know, they show some of my publications will be never available because some of them have the, um, the fourth name on the western section of the wall. Now, you can argue about exactly what it shows in rather schematic form. But I personally think that it shows um, a series of um, courage, the mild cards, with preservation, meaning preservation of the top. They are linked by a, a stretch of um, Masonry wall, which has no preservation. And I think that if I'm correct, that the uh, Hadrian Hall was using the raised wall with a, um, a parapet on the inside, you don't really want um, preservation. But even if they are of the sort of which David talked about, you can have a sphere and you can have it at the end of the string, you can lock it up, and then you can you lock on the end of the string in the middle. And you may between the two um, elements, and then you can just climb up the wall. So I think there's a, a possible, um, there's a reason maybe for not having preservation on the raised, uh, on the, uh, <coughs> or, or on the little wall behind the top of the wall. That's probably more than that. It would be pretty well. Do I know if you want to reply to the video for the part? Take other questions first. Well, I'll it's better just to give them quick response by yeah. impression. It's not a very long interest. I, quick response is, sorry Mark, I'm really simply not impressed with the idea of cavalry um, galloping along the riding on the top of the bike. And I think, but uh, not just because of that slip, but because I think this is really coming to the heart of one of the issues of how these projects work. And I would argue you won't waste your cavalry. Um, on frontier patrol routes like that, and then uh, be out. But it could be just loaded. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. I, I would have to admit, I, after Paul Greenwell's discussion with you and the evidence a few years ago, I changed my mind. I will accept that it is very possible that there was a war one uh, with the original tent of the for, which is tent for Y. But you put your finger on a real problem. It was reduced in thickness, even while being built to eight or even six feet wide. So you have what? A, a foot wide parapet at the front. You, in, when it's so narrow, you're now down to five feet, you might want one at the back so you don't fall over. Soldiers carry shields. Maneuverability is not great. Um, it, it, so we could actually have a situation where the original idea was to have a war war, and then um, when it was narrowed, uh, the, the, the idea would change. And we, we just don't know. But if you, you, you know, put the people on a, 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 a real issue. The other one where I hope Everhard will come back, I would come back on him, is our question of records. I mean, are they okay? We've had that lovely quotes from Everhard about uh, a Romans attacking, uh, well disciplined armed Romans attacking German defending. Uh, earthworks. Uh, 
the, the, the problem I have in trying to see Hayley Ford as a defensive is what the heck the other side is going to do against the Romans. Hayley Ford, we think, 12, we said we talked about high, possibly even higher as planned. There's a ditch in front of it, which is 30 feet wide, beyond the, a berm, which is 20 feet. 50 feet away, what weapons are the Caledonians to throw at the Romans on top of the wall? I don't get it. But he might have an answer. Yes. Um, <laughs> 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 but didn't answer in yours first. I mean, uh, Harold's first answer. Yes. Uh, not not by the Caledonians, but I think the main purpose is that you take what people are trying to get across your defenses while they are um, while they're plundering over. And um, it certainly arrows were quite speculative, so I think they've got 20 arrow heads and all just for a little bit of defense from excavation. Um, I just wanted to very briefly respond to one question Mark raised was the Palisade there at the same time as the as the Rembrandt. My understanding is that there's no mainstream belief that it was not on it, that the Palisade probably would have rotted as it was it tends to do and was replaced by by a bank. Possibly also reflecting an increase in shortage of input. But um, we don't know 100 percent but that is my understanding. That's probably my understanding. If you actually go and look at the reconstruction, which um, when I was uh, last in the like 17 years, and it, 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 you can press against it and it rocks around everything, of course. So you can press against it and it's waving to and fro. Um, but the, the, Difficult to hear because it, the timber is about half the size of what it should be. But even so, you can still lots of ground. But if you were an, an attacker, would you run the risk? I mean, you would see the things sticking up. You'd have to get quite close to know they'd rock it in the book. Could it be that you took both right? I'm doing it in terms of. Uh, I hear about said castles um, and that they might primarily have been for a defensive or military purpose, but then as time goes by or in good times and like with the wall then they become like you know passport control customs, whatever. But there's equally the flexibility, the capability for them to become manned and, and, and be a fighting defensive structure according to how the times are going, which seems to be ideas about battles in that respect. I think that's an excellent point. Um, coming back to this passage in Pass in the Summons, I don't think that the Germans kept the permanent guard on the on the wall. The they would have defended them in at the point of need, but of course then in the other parts and fully I'm fully misstated that, of course, uh, they, they also have uh, points where you could levy taxes, where the border could be crossed. So, yes, yes, I would very much agree with that. I, I, I would simply add that, I mean, one of my great problems with Hayden's wall is you, you, you put your finger on it, we don't look at it in time depth and accept that it will change over 300 years. But you'll go back from today to change six, and a lot's gone, sorry, first <laughs> 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 yeah, I feel a lot's changing that time. And we don't think you know, so I'm talking about that. Uh, Richard Hayes, could I just examine your ideas? You're talking about crenellations on the wall and a wall walk. That suggests you're having dismantled infantry type soldiers and archers firing between these lovely stone buttresses that their flanks protect. With a lovely war walk, they can all get to the point of battle without heavy hand. How many soldiers do you think it would take to defend that length of war 24 hours a day? And if you don't defend it 24 hours a day, what's the point in having a defensive force? Examine then the idea of these war courts, which are fairly frequent along the wall. You haven't mentioned anything about possible use as signal stations, but these are the tripwires that are going to alert the force with the big soldiers in further back there as the QRF, the quick reaction force. The wall will as a barrier certainly to hinder, if not stop the enemy, it will dismount them. Therefore, they're at a disadvantage on foot. 
therefore your cavalry can get them and get them off behind the line if they manage to get through in the first place. But I can't see that you have enough soldiers to man that wall 24 hours a day um, as a defensive line, and always you want to have depth in defense when you have this. So that's your first line of tripwire, if you like. Um, and I would ask you to comment on that. I think I've got the points about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we just make the special with that? Remember everything. Um, it, 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 it's really challenging. But the, the great advantage of his data planning is that you is the singular and the plural separately. So I'm not sure whether your question was do, being one of us, or C, being both of us. Was the question addressed to both of us? Uh, or, it, no, I think it was. There's a mess of the sort of walls that we saw in um, some of the German examples there uh, did not appear to be there as a modern. Uh, so sure. you're really interesting yourself, Trevor. And allowing him to repeat the question and put whatever gloss he wants in it. How tight did you do it? Oh, we're not saying that. Well, we're not saying that. It's not quite his penetration. Okay. Is it? You know, the penetrations of the wall will suggest you've got dismounted troops manning the wall at the time. Yes. Then the ultimate problem with all of this. Is that there are there are um, what one might would accept as facts when you can twist it away. So Everhard's line, I mean this is built in a very defensive position. But he's only shown you in, in the short stretch, which is 12 or 15 miles long, along the cracks in the center. And in other places, he's not in that strong defensive position. The most Recent work, which is 2009 by Grunfeld and Sergio Antonio, which is really, he looks at how the war was surveyed. And this is just Hayden's war. And he, the point he makes is it's not actually the best defensive position. It's where it is on a ridge, um, not the crags, the ridge, I mean, but elsewhere, because it maintains communication to the south with the forts behind the wall. If it was in the best defensive position, it would be a little further to the north, it would be on the front brow of the hill, and it would uh, be seamless in the landscape, which is, of course, an exact description of the Axman Wall, but that's another point. So that's one issue about uh, it, 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 its defensive position. Um, the, 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 there is a, another crucial point which I haven't mentioned, which yeah, I can't ask for it. Sports on the heart. But then, um, one of the interesting, again, relatively new discoveries in the last 20 years, the current generation of, of research, has shown that towers uh, and narcasses on Hades Wall often a slightly out of position. Why is this? Because they are trying to make communication back to these ports uh, in the existence in, behind the wall. And the implication of this is a 24 hour watch of war. It has to be that these towers are in an absolute location to make take communication north-south. So it, uh, this doesn't have to make it defensive, though. It simply, in my view, back to frontier control. And, uh, but a tight frontier control will be would otherwise have, have anticipated. I agree on that point. Can I make a very brief comment as well on this? Uh, you say you wouldn't have enough soldiers to guard all of the wall 24 hours a day. Of course, they don't, but neither do you need them. Because, of course, the very first thing you have probably advanced intelligence of something which happened. Secondly, while people are trying to make the way across those obstacles, it gives you some more time to gather tools, and there's of course a very sophisticated signaling system as you like. I don't think that the only body does many buildings to be called today. They knew the Roman army was coming. They met them at the at the point where they knew that knew the world would be would be attacked. And I think the Romans probably did the same. Um, can you repeat again? No, no. Can you just stand up? That will help. Uh, that that thing is good. It's uh, I just maybe I can just. 
and the research hasn't been done, but I feel not as strong that you know, that the empire is starting to have a land tax on it. It's not really enough volunteers for the army. Um, and and um, that's why I'm suggesting that perhaps frontiers are built uh, for, for this reason. Um, Lawrence Kepp has made the same points about the Antonine War. We actually see legions of people out there at the Antonine War, which is very unusual in, in British terms. They're not on campus in each other quite a bit. So that's what I'm teasing the word out. It's, it's a question, something here we need to do, to do research on. But I do think we come back to these really very, very difficult questions. Is why uh, the Hades War is, is so massive. And I, I really can't help but feel that it's actually something to do with what Hades was trying to, the statement he was trying to make himself. No, I don't want to repeat arguments which I've made before, but I want to focus on one particular aspect which I think we haven't been discussing before. And I would agree with um, one of the questions which have been given in your lecture, David, that this picture of these large hordes of barbarians storming towards Adrian's wall was probably not one which you would have witnessed very often. If you go with a uh, time machine and travel sort of back in time to, um, to look at what was happening in this. But why did, why did you make this decision? Because the systems are simply very effective. And I think we've been discussing much how easy or difficult would it be to, to get through a wall across the wall, and we may slightly disagree with how, how, how precisely would you have problems with the defenses? But the one thing which we haven't discussed, what actually assuming you succeed, what happens next? Because, <clears throat> because I think this is the real thing, this is an even greater danger. Because even assuming, even assuming you run through this ancient mind to feel the equivalent unharmed, assuming you manage to scale the wall or somehow break a hole into it, be it Hadrian's wall or maybe the Golden Wall. And then you venture into the hinterland, engage in plunder. What will happen next? You have to, you have to return. And I think this is a really dangerous point because how do you return? You have to, of, of course, you may have your pursuers who are behind you. Um, you then have to cross the road again with your pursuers because they have been duty on you. And I think this is the really, really dangerous point and you are taking a suicidal risk by engaging in it. Unless, unless you're very strong and you're very numerous. And that's one passage in Caesar. And uh, Caesar describes it, the tribe of the Nervi, the Belgic Gaul, as a deep cover. So what do they do? Um, they build along the boundaries, they build uh, we build this in one word, they create hedges out of very stony bushes, which it is very, very hard to get through. But even if you manage, then of course, um, once you've, you've raided some of the, some of the woods of the Nervi, then again you have to cross the hedge for a second time. And that gives your opponents, even if they have no stone cavalry, a real chance to catch up with you and to um, take away the wood from the wood, but possibly to kill them. And for this purpose, I think the reason why our frontier wars, albeit only if they're well managed, are highly effective, is because people were well aware of the enormous risk which they would be taking, first by crossing them, and then by having to cross them again. I think it was a high highly effective system, and it was a system which contributed much, I believe, to the security of Britain, to the security of, of ancient Persia, much more so than a string of 